Hey everyone, this is Shaman from Rocket Ship HQ, the mobile user acquisition firm that lets you grow in a capital efficient manner. My guest today is Misha Serochuk. Misha is the head of ad networks and programmatic for UA at Huge Games in Warsaw, Poland. Misha has worked for over five years in digital marketing and he has led UA for the games Billionaire Casino and Huge Casino. Misha is someone with incredible expertise and experience in managing DSPs and programmatic media buying, and he's executed programmatic buys at massive scale for huge games. And I'm very excited to dive deep into all things programmatic buying with Misha today. I'm very excited to welcome Misha Serochip. Misha, very excited to have you on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Same here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and we're going to dive into an area that I'm very, very curious about myself, just because you've been in this area for at such a huge scale for so long and developed so much expertise. This is absolutely something I would like to dive in with you. And this is programmatic. To start with the basics, tell us what programmatic means and how it's different from what a smaller app developer might do with, let's just say, doing UA on Google, Facebook, Snapchat. Sure, yeah. So programmatic, the definition of programmatic is buying media in real time. Uh, what's important here is on multiple ad exchanges in multiple ad formats and using CPM as pricing model. So this would be a very basic definition. When we speak about Facebook here, we um, mostly buy in Facebook inventory, so newsfeed, Instagram, etc. And a media buyer has a massive control over their campaigns and uh, budgets and how they perform. When we talk about Google, um, in Google there are more lim limitations, but still user pretty much is buying Google inventory. Yeah. That includes as well search inventory, which unfortunately mm -hmm. is not available on Facebook or programmatic. Um, so programmatic has a lot more in common with Google, in my opinion, than with uh, Facebook. So similarities here would be that, you know, as similar to as Google, in Google, you would need to wait a few days, a few weeks for campaigns to start spending. Uh, it's also not advised to make drastic changes on daily basis. And uh, you kind of would have to trust uh, machine learning and the black box. But there are also a uh, few differences. So in programmatic world, uh, there is mostly no self-serve dashboard. They have to talk to your account manager. Uh, there is very little control of where the ad is served. So unless you specifically highlight, I don't need, don't want this publisher, then uh, you most likely will end up serving your ads all over uh, in, in all the list of publishers. Um, there is also very little uh, targeting options in terms of interest or, or demographics. So this would be relatively similar to Google um, examples. Um, now, what's important here also to highlight, there are two kind of programmatic media buying options. Uh, one is self-served and one is managed. When we speak about programmatic DSE, uh, we mean the user acquisition managers, we usually talk about managed uh, programmatic DSPs. And uh, those would be a big companies, few examples of them, um, uh, Liftoff, Arki, Gross Install, uh, Charbus D, DSP, et cetera. Uh, now, the, the way they would be identified, I would put it that way, is that uh, first of all, you will talk to your AM and there will be very little things you can do by yourself other than set up the daily caps, send the creatives, or even talk what campaigns you want you want to have. They would be also needed more time to speed up. And they would be, again, very similar to Google um, UAC in terms of understanding what is this. There is a relatively new uh, self-served DSP or self-serve programmatic options available on the market. Uh, this would be uh, very similar to Facebook in the sense that you have full control. You can uh, make a decision where you want your ad to be served, on which audience list, on which lookalikes, etc., which bidding options. Um, however, the challenge here is that uh, because you have all the control, you want to do changes very quickly, uh, and you may you may end up. Uh, not maybe waiting enough time or not plugging in the right algorithms. So most likely your user acquisition campaigns will not be performing well. At least they will not perform well for us. Uh, so two examples of those self-serve DSPs would be Kaizen and Appreciate. Um, and there probably will be more, more coming soon. And 
I do recommend using them, especially for retargeting. For yeah. user acquisition, unfortunately, yeah. we did not happen to make them work. So it sounds like this is media buying outside of Google, Facebook, Snap, uh, so their walled gardens, and uh, which is perhaps why some of the smaller apps that we work with don't necessarily need to look at programmatic. Uh, but I'm curious as to what kind of companies programmatic is a good fit for. And also tell me what inspired your team to start testing out programmatic the first time you guys did it. What was sure. the trigger at the time? Yeah, so maybe first part of the question, what kind of companies programmatic is, is good for? Um, I think first of all, um, it's a good for companies that have already explored uh, media buying on Facebook and Google, maybe some other channels like Snapchat, Twitter, etc. cetera. And um, I'll, I'll look into uh, to explore further options. It's also a good feed for the companies who have a big investments opportunities in user acquisition, uh, have patience and actually can wait a few weeks or months for the results to mature. Uh, it's good for the companies who have product with uh, not necessarily low customer acquisition cost. Um, one more thing, it's also good for the companies who probably have some limitations with Google and Facebook. And uh, for example, uh, gambling is, is highly limited uh, area where not everywhere media buyer can can purchase media in our case we are social casino advertiser uh, we have also the limitations on google in which countries we can purchase media and for example in russia uh, uac is not available for social casino and whereas facebook is available but it's rather limited in terms of inventory so if we as a social casino advertiser want to purchase media in russia uh, it's good to go beyond uh, right. Facebook, where Google is not available. Another example could be Belgium. Recently, Facebook has not stopped allowing advertising social casino in Belgium. So yeah. except Facebook, then there is Google available and obviously everybody else. So there are limitations in geographics that uh, you should consider whether your product is suitable for. And the reason why we jumped in into programmatic, because we are, we have been doing UA for some time and uh, we have those few limitations that already mentioned, but also we are always looking to uh, acquire new media sources that will be able to bring us those extra revenue in, in the very niche market that we operate. Uh, so it happened a few years ago and we do work with those programmatic media partners up until today and they became yeah. uh, probably in between 20 to 40 percent um, share in terms of UA spend depending on yeah. OS or country uh, yeah. in huge games portfolio. Wow. Yeah, and those are substantial numbers. You did say that programmatics usually right for companies that are A, willing to make a big investment, and B, are able to wait for the machine learning, by which I'm also hearing that early on the numbers are going to be terrible. Is that always the case? Can you explain why companies need to wait for the machine learning to learn? and why those big investments are necessary? And what sort sure. of big investments are we talking about here? What, what just numbers wise? Sure, sure. Um, so um, majority of the managed DSPs out there will want to sign insertion order for at least a few hundred uh, dollars. So for example, $20,000 or $50,000. The reason why there is even a need for exploration is because they are starting promoting your game without knowing what this game is all about, what kind of users are the right users. If you go on Facebook, for example, and you promote, in our case, social casino games, uh, Facebook already know what is the right user. So if you'll upload another social casino game, Facebook knows what kind of user the ad to show to. If you go to a programmatic media uh, space, uh, unfortunately, they cannot use other advertisers' learnings onto your campaign, so they have to start from scratch. And uh, the first few weeks, there would be exploration where uh, the main purpose of uh, programmatic would be to lower the customer acquisition cost, so the CPI. Then right. once this is done and they, uh, they, they were able to collect a few payers' information, they will start adjusting to modify the algorithms on to acquire the right payers, not just uh, the lower cost per install. So this is the reason why the exploration needs to be on few weeks period of time. Sometimes it happens uh, faster. There are a few DSPs out there where 
you can actually pre-send them selection of your user base from the history. Right. Right. Uh, for example, top engaged users, medium engaged users, and not engaged at all. And they would analyze this and uh, feed the machine learning with this information. So your initial first weeks of UA campaigns might be more successful than you would be with somebody else out there. Right, right. So it's the learning phase, except of course, these DSPs don't have quite the amount of data that Facebook has, which is what takes the time to build exactly the learning phase. Got it. And when working with the DSP, what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen people make? Yeah. So by common mistakes I see people make, I would rather say I see we made or I made okay. uh, while yeah. working with, yeah. with, the, with the SP. So uh, those could be mistakes or other things I maybe could have avoided. So A, scaling too fast. So uh, as a user, a position manager, you want to scale uh, if the results are good. It could be that they are good because of the random few purchases uh, yeah. of few payers. Uh, so uh, yeah, a, scale too fast, B, pausing too fast, uh, similar, yeah. but the, the opposite one. Uh, C, 100% uh, trusted the account manager on the DSP side. I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't trust our account manager, but we should challenge them uh, very often and uh, not necessarily 100% listen to the best uh, practices that are recommended. We, we should be more creative and I would say suggest different ideas than they would be able to accept and push it. And um, one more is not being transparent. Uh, so uh, not necessarily that we not depend in DSP to be transparent, but us as an advertiser not being transparent with our DSP partner. So what I mean here, uh, sending, for example, postbacks in the real time. So our DSP partner would be able to verify the quality, uh, sharing as well suppression lists uh, of devices that already have our games installed so they wouldn't be targeted again, etc. And maybe last but not least is not asking hard questions. Uh, so uh, what I mean here is just to um, go very deep into details with your account yeah. manager into all different machine learning um, and details that you can. Um, yeah. The example here uh, that I can bring is we uh, few some time ago, or say years even ago, we started working with one DSP and uh, the results were great. So after a few weeks of scaling, uh, we actually ended up asking very hard questions like um, where, where the, what kind of exchanges they are buying from, how the machine learning work, how they optimize towards payer rate or any further uh, down the funeral events. And it turned out that the answers were not existing. So we realized yeah. that the reason why this DSP was successful was rather luck and not actually any big machine learning behind yeah. it. And a few, sometime after that, the results started dropping and we ended yeah. up uh, pausing this, this partnership. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to dig, dig into some parts of that because when you're like, look, I want to understand what's happening with the machine learning. What are some of the aspects of machine learning that you seek to understand? What are some of the questions you might ask to say, oh, let me understand how your machine learning works. I'm trying to understand what are some of the things one might look for as a UA manager that's trying to evaluate a DSP from a machine learning capabilities point of view. What, what would you advise there? Sure, sure. So um, maybe let's look at the example of uh, Facebook, where Facebook has few, or even Google USC, few um, um, ways of optimizing. So in Facebook, you can have mobile app uh, install campaigns, you can have app event optimization, you can have value optimization, right? So these three different algorithms has its reason behind it and, and has, uh, has its way to optimize. So similar with also the other DSPs have. Some DSP would have machine learning approach to optimize on the day seven payer rate. Some would be optimizing on uh, lifetime value. Some would be optimizing on cost per payer or cost per purchaser, etc. Uh, and majority of them would be changing models. Uh, they wouldn't just have one model and it would run forever. So it's good to uh, challenge them and actually ask, okay, why your model is optimizing on lifetime value if maybe I want to have uh, the cheapest installs at this moment because I'm looking to uh, buy as many as possible to be ranked number one in the app store. So, so this would be examples of hard questions and that you can ask not necessarily to account manager, but feel free to bring it uh, 
further and talk to the product team and see what they have to say about it. Yeah, and I imagine that's also important and necessary just because there's so many DSPs in the market. I know you probably get tons of pitches. You've evaluated so many of them, right? And uh, certainly something we talked about earlier, like the last time we spoke. So what are some of the things, other questions you might ask other than machine learning, right? And how would you assess that test period once you start to work with the DSP? Sure, yeah. I guess before we would be on board in a new DSP partner or maybe any other partner, we would, uh, we would be able to divide this uh, new potential lead into, uh, into verification stages. So yeah. I would call it that way. So the first verification stage would be when we actually talk to them directly and ask about their past performance. So let's say yeah. a new programmatic partner wants to uh, work with us and um, sell amazing uh, inventory that they have, I would ask, okay, uh, tell me whom do you else work with in the gaming industry? Uh, send me a successful case study. I also have some connections, so we have some connections within the gaming industry, so I can reach directly to that company that they would mention and verify whether they actually uh, work with this with this new programmatic partner, etc. Um, and moving forward, we would, uh, with all the new partners, we would actually uh, ask for a test budget, which would be a few uh, thousands of, of dollars. And the reason, and this test budget would be actually um, um, for test, use for testing with no obligations from our side. And during this period of uh, of few weeks, we would require at least 15 starts per day for the period of at least 10 to 14 days where we would be able to assess a longer cohorts, quality of the longer than seven days cohorts. And after that, if the results would be uh, satisfying us, they not necessarily have to meet the expectation 100%, but they have to show the positive trends. We would start moving with the regular uh, IO. And and, and this is our current verification process that we would would apply to all the new partnerships. Understood. And when you speak about the test budget, and you said 15 stalls per day, that's what you look at to evaluate. My understanding, and I worked in social casino a couple of years ago, my understanding is social casino is very well driven. And do you find that just 15 stalls a day gives you enough of a good idea as to whether a DSP can identify players and bills for you? It's a good question. So, of course, it's not enough, but it will show yeah. trend. So, right. let's imagine we will have one whale per every 20,000 installs. So 15 subs per day times 10 days will not be enough uh, yeah. since we'll only get 500, but we will already see what are the engagement KPIs, whether right. uh, these users monetize, progress, uh, the retention. Uh, there will be payers already. There yeah. should be actually payers already, not necessarily whales. So those payers, of course, they will, will see whether they buy the, the cheapest package of um, 199 or they buy more expensive package. So they're already methodologies of verification of this traffic. Right. Um, right. Uh, they will be rather lucky if they will catch the whale and uh, there will right. be very great, I would say, situation. Yeah. However, this is not something we, we are looking for. Right, so you're basically saying, oh, we have a payer profile. Are they able to identify the payer profiles and other, other users who have the same, same profile? Are they going to acquire those for us? That's what you're looking for. Exactly. Got it, got it. Now that makes complete sense. The other aspect that I'm very curious about is creatives, because again, programmatic is generally considered a black box with something like Facebook and Google. There's fairly extensive creative experimentation that can happen. How does creative on programmatic differ just because you don't even have a dashboard in most cases to manage all these things? How do you work with creators? What's the typical creative strategy like? Right. So when we work with programmatic, we work with uh, managed partners. So they manage our campaigns uh, yeah. on, on our behalf, on their own dashboards. Th- that means that they also create their own creative from our assets. So the reason why they do it is because uh, they buy in CPM and they want to make sure that costs per install would be minimized. Uh, yeah. So they would rather experiment with creatives on their side where they can e- e- iterate quickly and not wait for us to um, um, to send them the, the new creatives. So this is basic of my statement, but 
to move forward, the creatives is not number one reason that campaign will be working or not, but the targeting uh, is something that would define whether campaign and cooperation is working. So once the right targeting is achieved, which yeah. is because of uh, machine learning and algorithm uh, targeting the right users, then the creative should actually be showing the casino element. So, uh, right. meaning coins, diamonds, slot machines, right. uh, et cetera. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that misleading creatives would work for us, which yeah. makes sense because the casino audience is very niche. Let's say yeah. it's a rather 40 plus users. And if they would see very misleading uh, creative, and even if they would download, they would be very confused as what this game is. They, right. uh, they don't really like changes that much. They would rather uh, see the creative that would actually reflect slot, the uh, slot game that they want to play. So if we, we did experiment with misleading creatives where we end up att attracting yeah. users that are not the right users and they would turn right away. Right. And if we show the right creatives to the right users, uh, that's a way to work in this area. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense in the context of uh, creators, just because I think it sounds like the most important thing in programmatic is for the DSP to identify a potential payer, identify a potential installer, engager, and if the creators are secondary to that identification process, it sounds like. What would you say transparency means in the context of programmatic and why is it important? Yeah, actually transparency is really important uh, while working with DSPs. We haven't realized this at the real beginning, like a few years ago, but now this is must. And transparency should be on all different areas. So we need to see in the real time, what is the publisher name? Uh, what is the exchange name? Uh, what are the creatives name, uh, etc. cetera. There, there are a few reasons. Let's say uh, one of them is fraud. So uh, there will be cases is when fraud will be as well on programmatic uh, available and it's not the DSP fault or it's not necessarily DSP fault. So um, we had one time situation uh, that I would like to talk about. So one DSP partner of us purchased a few hundred installs from publisher, let's call it ABC. Yeah. The quality was great. However, the concern that I had was that this publisher were few who a friends of mine are working, uh, doesn't uh, serve ads. Uh, they, mm -hmm. are, they have different model and we don't yeah. reach out to them directly. And I asked, hey guys, did you uh, change your monetization model and start serving ads? The answer was no. So I brought it up to our DSP partner, which uh, under understood the case and took it with exchange where uh, the impressions were purchased from. Uh, and then we got charged back for the amount of money that was spent on this publisher, which then was a, was a fraudulent. Uh, yeah. Very important to have transparency when speaking about anti-fraud. Yeah. Another one is uh, negotiation power. Uh, yeah. by the, uh, we also work with some of the um, ad networks directly, and two examples here could be named Unity and Uplovin, which you can purchase media from directly, but you also purchase through DSPs via the ad exchange. So knowing how much actually you spend in this specific uh, uh, media sources, direct versus indirect, would be is good information for your further negotiation power when you write right. different deals. And maybe last but not least, it's also important to spot uh, different trends and verify machine learning. So example could be uh, if uh, our user acquisition campaigns would start purchasing installs from games for kids, something is definitely wrong here because majority of our uh, users are 40 plus users and our game right. is for kids for sure. So, um, so it's good to verify and double check whether this yeah. is a good approach. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Out of curiosity, as a marketer and a user acquisition manager, is there a way you educate yourself about, oh, what's happening with the machine learning? How do I learn and figure out what's happening and what's perhaps a technical subject? Yeah, uh, I try my best. Of course, of course. It's, it's not that easy because usually our, uh, the people we talk to from our programmatic partners are not the product people. So, of course, they know yeah. a lot, uh, but product people would be the one who would answer all of your questions. So, uh, yeah. 
I do ask them all the questions I have, and yeah. uh, there is often situation where they would suggest or I would suggest that we jump on the call or meet with the product people, and I would continue answer this question. So every once in a while, at least once a year, I try to meet with the product people from sure. all the diplomatic uh, partners uh, while being on uh, conferences, events, or while just visiting the offices. Sure and uh, try to understand what's new they are working on, how we can help feeding algorithm yeah. to yeah. Uh, help it buying users for us in the most effective way. Right, right. It sounds like you go above and beyond, and it's indeed that indeed explains why you see the success you do. What typically has to happen before the team says, right, I've been buying on a DSP, we're doing a lot, let's try to do all it programmatic buying in-house? What has to happen to have that happen? That's a good question, actually. So um, every once in a while, when you think about how much money you spent on programmatic and you know that part of that money are actually the fees that the company um, take for themselves, you realize, oh, maybe it would be a great idea to build own bidder and yeah. bring programmatic in-house. It does sound like a good idea. Um, and I'm sure a lot of companies uh, have that in, in the mind. So a few things have to happen. For, first of all, uh, the company has to be super BI savvy. So um, they need to have already, they need to know already everything about the users, how to create the LTV, and uh, whether the user in the first one hour after acquiring will become payer, purchaser, payer, etc. And second is the company uh, should be able to allocate at least few full-time people, so two few people in BI, um, at least one person in UA for at least months or even years in, in this project, uh, yeah. as it will take time to build, to verify, uh, to verify the model, etc. It also takes just so much time to connect all the ad exchanges. It could take months. The ad yeah. exchanges have to verify you and accept it's not that easy and uh, company also need to be aware that the investments will be at least a few million dollars and uh, for the period of at least probably years um, yeah. before you you'll see any light at the end of the tunnel so uh, i i know a few companies are thinking about it and trying or maybe uh, researching uh, however I've, I've heard about one that relatively succeeded and few that that failed um, I, I do want to highlight here that of course it would be great to bring programmatic in-house but it also would be great to maybe bring attribution in-house and not right. pay attribution companies fees and maybe it would be great to you know take off the app store okay. and the yeah. uh, iTunes store fees and not pay them as well so I think we as a mobile gaming companies are good in what we do best mobile yeah. games and I'm happy Huge Games is focusing on, on doing more mobile games instead of maybe trying to bring something else in-house where uh, we may fail. And, uh, and that's the reason why a lot of other companies uh, succeed uh, that actually just doing what they are doing best full time. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that explains why, you know, building programmatic bidders isn't a mobile gaming company's core competency explains why it's so hard to build programmatic infrastructure and indeed uh, I think it also points to how much effort it takes to succeed with programmatic which is absolutely something you've done for the many years for many years now. Uh, Misha this was an honor to have you on the show uh, thank you so much for being a guest on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Can you tell our listeners how they can find out more about you? Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was, it was a pleasure. I am actually also following your podcast, so looking forward for this to be online. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, so my link is uh, Misha02. You can find me, I'm sure, uh, with majority of people out here already have a few, a few common connections. My my email is uh, misha at hugegames.com. So that's another way to connect me. And uh, I'll be trying to be a few times a year in industry events. So uh, that's yeah. an opportunity to meet face to face. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now that we're in the same continent, definitely looking forward to meeting you at one of the events. Uh, I'm excited for that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Saman. For more tips, 
pointers and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog. Thank you.